Again, thank you so much for coming out. And I want to start real quickly. A couple of housekeeping things I forgot to mention last week because that's just the way I roll. It's the way my brain works. Because um, I didn't put it on the syllabus, so I probably should have. The uh, midterm test, in case you're wondering, for those of you that are taking credit, should probably give you that on if we're on schedule, if we can get back on schedule night on February the 6th. So the first test will go through Exodus 24. Okay, so that will be the Israelites being liberated from Egypt and then also the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. And then the final exam will pick up in Exodus 25 about the tabernacle and go through Leviticus. Okay, so just kind of a heads up on that. Uh, and I want to tell you again a couple of things about the grades. The notes is pretty much, a, you know, I'm trying to give you points. So it's pretty much participation. If you make an honest attempt, I'm not going to bust your chops over that. Oh, you left out two words. You get 10 points. Off. I'm not going to do that. I'm just looking to see, hey, you really tried to take good notes, and then you get all the points for that. So that, that's how that works, just to let you know. Uh, now, the review questions, I do grade those for accuracy. So I do want uh, complete answers on that. And I meant to tell you, so if you already did this, I apologize on, on chapter one, but I meant to tell you, you'll notice some of those questions. It says, uh, you know, how did I phrase that? Give scriptural support. All I want you to do is, you know, if it's Corinthians 2, verse 14, that's all you got to write. I don't want you to write Corinthians 2, verse 14 out. Just answer the question, then at the end of the question, you can write the scripture without writing the whole thing out, just that, and I will know you're telling me that's your scriptural support. Fair enough? Because I don't want you to have to write all that out, although that's not going to hurt you, help you remember it, but I don't expect that. Just answer the question and then give me the scripture. Um, I think that's it. I think that's everything I should have said last week, but I didn't say. So those first review questions... Will be due next week because I said I like I want to finish whatever chapters are on there. So that's chapters one and two. We're going to start with chapter two tonight. So I'll give you this week to do that. If we can get through chapter six tonight, we're going to try to do that. And then those others would be due next week as well. So we'll we'll see how it goes. All right. So we are on uh, chapter two. Trina, did you get some of the new questions? And Trina, at the end of class, I'll just need to see your notes. I've already checked everybody else's so, since you're taking it for credit. Okay. All right. So last week we had an introduction, then we looked at chapter one, uh, which kind of sets the stage here. And so we saw that Pharaoh was very concerned about the Israelites because they were uh, really populating the place, and he thought they, they could join up with our enemies, they could overwhelm us. So he wants to kind of nip that in the bud, so we saw that they're going to be enslaved. He's going to try to make their life miserable. And then he declared, he told the midwives, I want you to kill all the male Hebrew children at birth. They got out of doing that by, hey, those women are tough, and they already have the baby before we can get there. So then he issues another decree, said, okay, fine, we're not going to play around anymore. Just after they're born, take the kid, throw them in the Nile River and drown them. We're just going to openly kill them. Okay? And so that's where we left off. So chapter 2 picks up. This is the, the time that Moses decides to be born. Well, he probably didn't decide it, but bad time for a Hebrew male child to be born. But this is when Moses is born, when this decree uh, is issued. So we want to take a look at the first 10 verses. Again, we don't have time to read all these. We're just kind of hitting the highlights and summarizing what you'd see in these verses. So it's at this time that Moses is born uh, to his parents, Amram and Jochebed. And we see this in Exodus 6 and verse 20. So we're not going to go read that, but again, you can make that reference where it tells us his parents were. And we also notice in that verse it says that she bare him Aaron and Moses. 
Okay, so this is where we're introduced that Moses also has a brother named Aaron. Now, is he going to play a significant role in our narrative here? Yeah, probably. He's got a big role to play too. And so we notice in Exodus 7 and verse 7 that Aaron is older than Moses. Okay, in Exodus 7 and 7 says, And Moses was fourscore years old. So how old is that? Anybody know what a score is? 20. Yeah, so he's 80 years old. Four score, he's 80 years old. Right? So Moses was four score years old, and Aaron four score and three years old when they spake to Pharaoh. So the first time they went to see Pharaoh. But that establishes that Aaron is three years older than Moses. So he's he's his older brother. And then we also notice in Exodus 15 in verse 20, we see that Moses also has a sister. Now there may have been others, but these are the ones we're told about. Uh, and her name is Miriam. Okay, so he's got a sister named Miriam. And I think I put that up there, I did. And it says, and Miriam the priest of the prophetess, the sister of Aaron. Okay, so she's also the sister of Moses. And we're going to notice that she's also older than Moses is. She was born before him. Now we're not told like we are with Aaron. I don't know exactly how much older she was, but we're about to find out how we know that she was older. So Moses is born when this command has been given. I want you to throw all the Hebrew boys into the Nile River and drown them. So Jochebed, his mother, obviously she doesn't want that to happen to her son. And so she hides him for about three months. And she comes to the conclusion at the end of about three months that it's, gonna, it's getting increasingly hard. He's going to be discovered. They're going to kill him. Maybe they'll kill her too to punish her for hiding him. So she realizes this is kind of futile to, to hide him. She, she's not going to be able to keep this up. So she constructs a small ark, puts pitch on it, and she puts Moses in it, and she puts him uh, in the what the Bible says, the, the flags, that's just another word for the reeds, on the shore of the Nile River. So she puts him in this ark and puts him in the water there on the bank of the Nile River. Okay, now she, what she's hoping is what? What she hopes will happen. Yeah, somebody will find him. What kind of somebody? Do what? Well, that's who's going to find him, but mother's probably hoping at least somebody that won't kill him. Somebody that will have compassion and mercy and decide, you know what, I'm... I know the Pharaoh said to kill this child, but I'm not going to do it. So she figures if I keep hiding him, they're going to kill him anyway. This is the only chance that my child might have to survive because she doesn't know who's going to find him. But that's what she's hoping for, okay? And so he's Moses is going to be saved by this ark on the water. Now, does that sound like any other story we're familiar with? Noah, right? Same thing. So Noah and his family, that ark was a little bit bigger. They're also going to be saved by an ark on the water. So you've got some symbolism there. So she's hoping somebody will find him that won't kill him. Well, she's going to be in luck, but it would seem at first that this is really bad luck. Okay? Because Moses, of course, is going to be found by who? Pharaoh's daughter. Pharaoh's daughter. Okay. Now, why would that seem to be bad luck? Because Pharaoh's commanded to kill these kids. So you would think, well, his daughter's probably going to carry that out. So it would look like, we know this is fortunate, but it probably would have looked like at the time, oh no, Pharaoh's daughter's found him, but she's the one that's going to find him. Now, here's how that we know that Miriam was older. So if you look at Exodus chapter 2 and verse 4, it says, And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done with him. So Miriam is off somewhere where she can still see her baby brother, who's three months old, and she's watching to see 
Will they drown him? Will they keep him? What's going to happen when somebody, I assume if eventually somebody's going to find him, what's going to happen? So we don't know how much older Miriam was, but at least she was old enough to be cognizant of what was going on and she's paying attention to this. And so Pharaoh's daughter finds him, tells her maids to go get this and pull it out of the river. Of course, now we don't know. We, we talked about this a little bit last week. Who was the Pharaoh? We're not sure. So we don't know uh, which daughter this was, but a lot of their the Egyptian records are, you know, kind of varies on reigns and things like that. But it does kind of generally fit the time of maybe Tutmos the first. And so something that kind of interesting, if that's him, and I'm not saying that it is because I don't know, and we, we can't really nail that down. But if it was... His daughter could be uh, a woman by the name of Hatshepsut. Okay, now the reason she's significant is because she will later become Pharaoh herself. And female pharaohs, as you might imagine, in the world back then, were not very common. They were pretty rare, very patriarchal society. So you didn't have a lot of female pharaohs. There were a few, and only a couple of them, about two or three of them, are very well known. Okay, so you've got Nefertiti, who's very well known to the world, and Hatshepsut is one of them, and then probably the most famous one that you all probably know, Cleopatra, right? So, But Hatshepsut is very well known, maybe more to history nerds like me, but she's pretty well known to history. So she, she's going to be a, a big pharaoh in her own right. And the reason it might fit that this could be her, I'm not saying that it is, but the Egyptian records, one of the things they tell us about her is she had a soft spot for foreigners. So it might fit that she would not kill the child because again, going back to Exodus chapter 2, she knows who this is. And you look at verse 6, she opened it, she saw the child, behold the babe wept, and she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrew children. So she knew Moses was not an Egyptian. And she's the do- her father had given the command to drown this kid. But she's going to defy her father. That sounds like something based on what we know of Hapshitz that she would have done. But again, we can't prove that it's her. That's just kind of an interesting side bit there, but whoever this girl was, she definitely had compassion on this Hebrew child, so she decided, yeah, I'm not going to kill him. In fact, I'm going to keep him as my own son. So that works out really good for Jochebed, uh, Moses' mother. So things turn out really good, better probably uh, than she could have hoped. Now, the Pharaoh's daughter, she is the one who gives Moses his name. That name Moses, okay? So uh, the name Moses, it means uh, taken out or drawn out or drawn forth. And so she took him out of the river. And so she decided to name him Moses, okay? And that's uh, that's in verse 10, you see that. So it's at this moment that Miriam kind of sashays over Hey, just happened to be in the neighborhood. And so she asked Pharaoh's daughter, she asked the princess, would you, apparently overheard that I'm going to keep him for my son. Well, would you like me to find a nursemaid for him? Because that was typical of Egyptian women. Even with their own children, they would have a nursemaid. So would, would you like me to find somebody? So the princess says, yeah, sure, that's a good idea. Why don't you go find somebody? And in fact, you can tell this woman that I'll pay her. Okay, So who does Miriam get? Her own mother, Moses' mother, right? So this works out really good for Jochebed. Not only does she get to nurse her own son, but she gets paid too. So that's a pretty good deal how that works out. Now, of course, the the princess has no idea that this is Moses' mother, but, but that's who it is. Okay, So it does really work out probably as well or better than than Jochebed could have hoped, Uh, but that's how we kind of get started with Moses. So now once he's weaned, then the princess takes him into the palace and raises him as her own son. Now, we find out that Moses, 
in Acts 7.22 that Moses was very well educated in the Egyptian system. As you would imagine for Pharaoh's daughter's son, you would imagine that he would be. Uh, but we want to notice this verse here because it says something interesting, especially comparing to later events when Moses is going to start making excuses. So Acts 7.22 says, And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. Okay, so that's interesting. He was mighty in words. Because we're going to see Moses himself is going to try to use that excuse that he's not. But we see here that he was. Now, what does that mean exactly? It might be that Moses was not a great speaker. Maybe this means that, but he was very intelligent. And so he could talk to people and demonstrate his knowledge, but maybe he wasn't the best speaker. Or maybe he was, and he just, he's trying to convince God that he isn't. But that's what it tells us here, that he was mighty in words. So he got the best education that the Egyptians had to offer. Now, in Deuteronomy 34 in verse 7, we're not going to go read that, but that's where we learn that Moses lives to be uh, 120 years old. Kind of cutting some of that off, isn't it? Uh, Deuteronomy, that's 34 verse 7. 34 verse 7. So we learn that Moses lives to be 120 years old. Okay? So what I would like you to remember is that with Moses' life, we can basically break it down. We can divide it into three stages. Okay? Each stage lasting a very convenient 40 years. We said last week, you're going to see that number 40 a lot. So we can break his life down into these three stages of 40 years. Okay, So stage one, from his birth or until he was three months old, uh, up until he's 40 years old, he's going to live in the palace as Pharaoh's daughter's son. Okay, So that's the first stage, the first 40 years. Then from age 40 to age 80, so that second 40 years, Moses is going to leave Egypt, and we're going to find out why in just a minute. He's going to flee from Egypt, and he's going to head southwest, and he's going to go to a place called Midian. M-I-D-I-A-N, Midian. Which is southwest of Egypt. And he's going to live there for 40 years and work as a shepherd. And then, for his final 40 years, that is when Moses, beginning at age 80 and up until his death at 120, that's when Moses will be the leader of the Israelites, through God of course, leading them out of Egypt. Okay. So he only starts doing that when he's 80 years old. And we just read that. Okay. So that's just kind of an easy way to break down his life. First 40 years he lives in the palace. Second 40 years he's a shepherd in Midian. And then the last 40 years is when God is going to use him uh, to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, and build the tabernacle and all those things that are going to be done. Get the law at Mount Sinai. Yeah, did I say to Egypt? <laughs> meant from Egypt, yeah. There I go again. Yeah, he's going to lead him to Canaan from Egypt. No, 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 no. no. I told y'all last week. Sometimes my brain moves faster, or my mouth moves faster than my brain, and I get tongue-tied, so... Yes, yes, yes. So you all please tell me if you know, well, he just said that wrong. Because I, I don't know, you know, who's going to watch this on the video, and I, I don't want to be spreading incorrect information. So sometimes I'll say something like that. So y'all, please let me know. You're not hurting my feelings or insulting me. Just let me know. All right, then verses uh, 11 through 22. I got that up. So eventually, Moses, again, he's been living in the palace all this time, probably has every luxury you can imagine. When he gets to be 40 years old, and again, we see this 
among other places, in Acts 7 and 23. This is when Moses decides he wants to leave the palace and he wants to be around his own people. Okay, And Acts 7 23 says, And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren and children of Israel. So again, we know exactly how old he was. So that this begins the second 40-year stage of his life. And so while walking among the people, the Israelite people, he notices that there is an Egyptian who is beating or flogging one of the Israelites. And so Moses kind of takes a look around. You know, he doesn't see anybody. Think I can get away with this. And he murders the Egyptian. Which he thinks is in secret. So he kills the Egyptian. Now, it's interesting to kind of note maybe what he was thinking or, or kind of why he did this. Apparently, and we're not told exactly how, but at some point Moses had been given an indication. I don't know if God told him directly. Obviously later on God is going to talk to him directly. But in some fashion, God must have given Moses an idea that Moses was going to be used at some point to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. And I think this might have partially motivated him to do what he did here to, to kill this Egyptian. Okay? And so Moses is thinking, well, I'm supposed to be the leader of the Israelites, so maybe this is how I can start that. Okay? So what do you think, what's the mistake that Moses is making here? Maybe this is how I can start it. What's the mistake? Yeah, did God tell him to start it now? No. He took it upon himself maybe to say, you know what, I can, I can get this thing rolling and because I know I'm supposed to lead him out. But this was not the time and this was not the way that God wanted it to be done. God did not command Moses, hey, I want you to kill an Egyptian. So it wasn't the right time and Moses wasn't going about it in the right way. Kind of took it upon himself thinking, well, if I'm supposed to do this, maybe this is my opportunity you know, to get this thing started. Well, how do we know that he had some inkling of this? Well, look at the next couple of verses. We just looked at verse 23. Well, verses 24 and 25. So verse 24 tells about how he kills the Egyptian. Look at verse 25. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them but they understood not. So see, Moses had some kind of inkling already at that point that God is going to use me to lead these people out. You know, we don't know how he came by that knowledge, but he obviously had it. But says they, nobody else understood that. And again, Moses has mistimed this thing. So the next day, the very next day, Moses is walking around again and he sees two of the Israelites, they're fighting each other. And so Moses goes over there to break up the fight. We don't know exactly how he did it, but he was trying to separate them and, and break up the fight. And so we want to notice what one of these guys said to him. And we look at verse uh, chapter 2, verse 14. So one of the guys, he's breaking them up, and one of the guys says to Moses, and he said, who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptians? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. Right? So who made you the prince, the judge? Moses is thinking, Well, God did. I'm, I'm supposed to lead you guys out. So again, he's thinking now's the time. But God, that's not what God told him. Right? And so now when, when this guy asked him that question, what, what, are you going to kill me too? That must have sent shivers down Moses' spine. Because what does that mean? He's been, somebody saw him kill that Egyptian. 
Now, maybe it was the guy that was being beaten. We don't know if he was beaten into unconsciousness or maybe he saw Moses do it and he told everybody or somebody else was lurking around that Moses didn't see. But Moses has to know now, uh-oh, this is public knowledge. And this is the next day. Boy, it didn't take long. And that's how gossip works, right? It don't take long. Well, that word is going to circulate and guess who's going to hear about it? Pharaoh is going to hear about it. And so he orders Moses to be arrested and executed for the murder of this Egyptian. And so this is when Moses decides, I've got to get out of here. So he flees Egypt because they're going to kill him for this murder that he thought he'd done in secret, but turns out he hadn't done it in secret. And so this is when he kind of flees south in a southwesterly direction and he heads to this place called Midian. Okay, so once he gets there, he helps the, the daughters. We're not going to go kind of skip that story, but just say he helps the daughters of the priest of Midian. And this was a guy by the name of Ruel or Ruel, R E U E L. Probably butchered that. And so he was, he's called the priest of Midian. Ernest, do you have a question? I thought I saw you. Okay. So he helps, Moses helps their daughters, and so they, they tell Rule about this. And so something interesting that we notice is that Rule is also called Jethro in several other places. Chapter 3, verse 1, chapter 4, verse 18. There's some other places that this guy is referred to as Jethro. I don't think he's related to Uncle Jed. That's a different Jethro. Okay? It's not Jethro Bodine, but he's Jethro. Now, Bible critics, of course, they jump all over this. Well, which is? Is he rule? Is he Jethro? I see that that's a mistake in the Bible. How come in this verse he's called this, and then over here he's called Jethro? And is that a problem? Yeah, so one, one theory about that is maybe Jethro was his priestly designation since he's called the priest of Midian. That's a possibility. Maybe that was more like a title and then rule is his real name. Are there any other possibilities? Yeah, well, nobody has more than one name, do they? Pretty much we all do, right? So for me... My name is Mark, right? That's my first name, and that's a lot of people call me Mark. My middle name is Lee. Don't call me that. Nobody calls me that. Nobody's ever called me that, but it is my middle name. So if somebody said, hey, there goes Lee Stevenson and pointed at me, would that be accurate? Yeah? No, that's Mark. No, well, his name's Lee, too. Same thing. And I also have another name that Sister Kathy's going to enlighten us on. Steve. That was a nickname given to my, uh, not to, here we go again, given by my mother to me on the day I was born. Not that I remember that, mind you, but she relayed that, said when I was born, well, we're just going to call him Steve, short for Stevenson. It was a nickname and it stuck. And so all my close friends in school, Kathy's been a good family friend for years and years and years, so she calls me Steve. My wife Janice calls me Steve. She never calls me Mark. It took her a long time to get used to that. She didn't even know my name was Mark until probably till after we got married. Just didn't bother to tell her. Who cares, right? So who's Mark? Oh, my husband? Oh, yeah. She's just... Right? So all three of those for me, and if you talk to the kids who are in my class at school, they probably call me a lot of other names that shall not be repeated. Right? But so it can be, you can call somebody by different names. That's not a Bible mistake. It's not a contradiction. But some people are so desperate to find fault, they'll latch on to stuff like this. So this becomes Moses' father-in-law. He marries one of the daughters. They have a son. And again, he's going to live this life there, tending the flock for his father-in-law for about 40 years, living there uh, in Midian. Now, this is an important lesson for us. And that's why we study the Old Testament. We want to learn not just what happened, but, but you know, how is this significant? What can we get out of it? Um, Notice when Moses is 40, 
He takes it upon Himself. Well, if, if God wants me to lead the people, I'm just going to go ahead and do it. But He didn't consult God. He didn't wait for God to say, okay, now's the time. Now I'm going to use you to do this. So Moses was arrogant and he was impatient and just decided to go ahead and, well, let's just go ahead and make things happen. But the time was not right. Who knows when the time is right? God does. Right? And you and I don't need to supersede that and say, well, you know what? I can tell better than God when I need to move on something or, or do something, especially of a spiritual nature like this. Okay, so we as humans, we often are impatient. We want things, you know, to happen too rapidly and we need to be patient. We need to understand that, you know, if we have faith in God, God will work His plan in our lives when? When He's ready. It's not up to me to decide that. Okay? I just need to be willing to follow when God through His providence, if He opens a door for me and kind of, lead, you know, He's not going to do it in a miraculous fashion. But if you're led in a certain direction, well, when that happens, then you, you take that opportunity, right? But we don't need to, to tell God, well, you need to speed this up, Lord. We need to get this done quicker. And that's really kind of what Moses did. So we're going to see this contrast when Moses is 80. It's a very different attitude that he has at that point. Okay, and then to close out the chapter, verses 23 through 25, he's told that eventually the Pharaoh that wanted to kill him has passed on. So he doesn't have to worry about that anymore. Also, the Hebrews then, they think when Pharaoh dies, they think, okay, well, maybe the new Pharaoh. Maybe he'll be better. He'll treat us better. Things won't be so bad. Well, what do you think happens? Eh, maybe not. Right? So he, he's just as bad as the other guy, and, and they're still treated really horribly. So now they really begin to cry out to God. You've got to save us. You've got to help us. We're miserable. Things are, things are awful here. And we'll contrast that later when they get out in the... Man, it'd be great to go back to Egypt. Remember how good we had it back then? You know, it's just what situation you're in. But they really begin to cry out to God. And after this second 40 year period, now is the time when God is ready to put his plan into motion. And he knew all along when he was going to do that. And maybe one of the reasons is that the continued affliction of the Israelites tended, at least at this point, it brings them closer to God. God knows what He's doing. It brings them closer to Him, makes them more dependent on Him, which is what they should be. Now, isn't that true with us a lot of times too? If things are going great, we kind of take the credit and we, maybe we don't pray to God and, and thank God like we should. And then when a disaster happens, what do we do? Then we remember God's phone number. Oh God, you got to help me. You know. So the, the, the more they were afflicted, it brought them closer to God. Sometimes that's what it takes. So God knew what He was doing all along. So let's move to chapter 3. Verses 1 through 6. So, chapter 3 picks up again at the, the end of the second stage, that second 40 years in Midian. And as we already we looked at, Exodus 7 and 7, just repeating that, said that he was 80 years old when he's going to talk to Pharaoh for the first time. And then also we see in uh, X, uh, Acts, sorry, Acts 7 and 30. Yeah, that should be Acts 7 and 30. Why'd you let me do that, Bob? <laughs> that should be Acts 7 and 30. Just now notice that. Uh, and it says, And when forty years were expired, there appeared unto him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. So again, clearly says, after 40 years. And we just saw in 7-7 that Moses is 80 years old. So this is at the end 
of this second uh, stage in Moses' life. So Moses is he's tending the flocks. Question? Yeah. Yeah, Acts 7.30, not Exodus 7.30. I apologize for that, guys. So Moses, he's tending the, the flock on Mount Horeb, and, and so he notices that there's a, a burning bush. Well, we saw this past summer, you know, August, September, we had that drought, we didn't have much rain. There were a lot of wildfires. There were probably a lot of burning bushes and burning trees. And What's different about this one? Okay, it's not consumed. That's the miracle. It's not a miracle that there's a burning bush. But Moses noticed, wait a minute, this thing is not, it's on fire, but it's not being consumed. That's, that's going to grab his attention just like it would you or me. If you go, wait a minute, you don't see that every day. So it's not being consumed. So Moses is told to take off his shoes. Why? You are standing on holy ground because God is there. And so Moses, of course, complies with this because this is he is showing Moses, and Moses gets it, that we are to be reverent and respectful to God. We are to have the proper attitude about God. And so Moses shows this reverence. We need to have that same reverence, but so many people today do not. They don't respect God. They don't respect the Bible. They don't respect anything that God has said. They don't respect Christians. They mock them. They ridicule them. We see that all the time, and, and it's always been that case. It's nothing new. But God is not, there's not that respect, at least in our society. There used to be, me being again the American history nerd, we used to have a lot of respect and reverence for God considering how this country, regard, I don't care what the world tells you, this country was founded on biblical principles. It most certainly was. And I've got plenty of evidence to show you for that. So there was a far more greater respect for God used to be, but that's, that's evaporated. Uh, God's name is taken in vain so much, and now it's even in, you know, it's in text messages and memes and, you know, the OMG. And we know what that means. I don't even want to say it. Right? They used to say it out. Now it's just they'll put OMG. And I would hear students in, in the hallways just for the most trivial things. OMG, I forgot my sweater this morning. It's like, do you really have to put that in there? Can't you just say I forgot my sweater this morning? You got to take God's name in vain. But it's just they don't even think about it. It's just because God is not seen as anything special. Well, he wants Moses to understand where he is and who he's dealing with. And Moses does understand that. So God identifies Himself as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. So making that connection back to the patriarchs. This is who I am. This is who you're dealing with. And so Moses, as you can see here, has another sign of reverence that he turns away. And it's not just because the bush was so bright. That's not why he turned away. Why did he turn away? He's afraid, right? He has that, that righteous fear of God that we all should have. So he takes off his shoes. He turns away. He knows, I don't even need to look at God. I'm not worthy to look at God. Moses gets that. He understands it. We would do well to think that way as well. God is not our fishing buddy. God is not somebody we play golf with. God is not one of the good old boys. God is God. And there are some churches, I've seen it on the internet, I've read articles about churches doing, you know, they'll pray to God and they'll start the prayer of, hey, big daddy, how's it going, man? Let's rap for what, you know, they're trying to be cool and. Do you not understand how disrespectful that is? You can call me Big Daddy if you want. Not him. But I've seen him do it. Try, again, trying to be hip, trying to be cool, trying to, oh, let's, let's bring God to the masses where they, well, that's not the way God deserves to be treated and that's not the way God expects to be treated. So Moses is going to do this the correct way and we are commanded to do this throughout the Bible. 
Psalm 89 and 7 is just one example of that. It says, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints. Yeah, we don't address Him as Big Daddy in the church service. And to be had in reverence of all them that are about Him. We are to have that godly fear, that reverence, that awe. We're talking to the Creator of the universe. So something else I want to point out here, if we look at Matthew 22 and 32, God says He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Now at this point, they're all dead physically. But are they really dead? They're still alive spiritually. right? And so in Matthew 22, 32, notice how Jesus says this, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Okay? So you do have certain religious people today who are trying to tell people that our souls, our spirit, they are not eternal. You know, Well, if you go to hell, it won't be that bad. You'll be burned up and then it'll be over in a few seconds. And then you just won't exist anymore. You've got religious people teaching that doctrine. Well, is that what the Bible says? No. Our souls are eternal. We will live from the moment we were conceived. We're going to live forever, somewhere. Okay? And so he's showing this right here. He, I'm not the God of the dead. I'm the God of the living. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they are still alive. Not their physical bodies, but their spirits live on. They're still alive in January of 2024, and they will be forever. And you and I will be too. We need to understand that. All right, let's look at verses 7 through 10. So God tells when He's in the burning bush, He tells Moses, I've heard their cries. I'm going to deliver them. Now's the time. Now, it wasn't the right time 40 years ago, but now's the time. He says, I'm come down. I'm come down to Egypt. What does that mean? Is God going to physically come down to Egypt? Or is that figurative language? Figurative. In a way that Moses could understand. right? I, he's just saying, I'm going to take care of this. And I'm going to use you to do it. But I am going to deliver them. So he's not literally going to come down like Jesus did and take a physical form. Obviously that comes much later. But he, he says it in a, in a humanistic term that Moses can understand. Oh, okay. If you and I had to take care of something, we would have to go there to do it. So that's why he, he says that. But He's going to deliver them from bondage. He's going to take them to the land of Canaan that He had promised to Abraham. That I'm going to keep my promise. How many promises does God keep? All of them. If he may. So it's interesting that God describes Canaan as a land flowing with milk and honey. What does that mean? Yeah. You're going to have plentiful supplies there, and especially compared to when they wander around in the wilderness, right? You are going to have enough there, not just so you can survive, but you're going to flourish. You're going to love Canaan. It's going to be a wonderful land. He talks about the people that already live there, and he lists some of them specifically. We can just kind of collectively call them the Canaanites. And God tells Moses, don't worry about it. I'm going to deliver these people to you. You're going to conquer all these people. They're already there, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to give you this land. Okay? Right? And so God tells Moses, I'm going to use you to convince Pharaoh to let my people go. There we go. All right, verses 18 or 11 through 18. Now, here's where Moses starts to protest. He starts to offer some objections, some excuses. Wait, what? You want me to do this? Now, well, wait a minute, God. You sure about that? So he's going to offer these objections. Okay, so objection number one. In verse 11, 
Moses said, who, who am I? You want me to do? Who am I to lead the people out? Surely you need to get somebody else. I, I can't do this. So let's remember, how old is Moses at this point? He's 80. Remember back when he was 40? He was arrogant and cocky and yeah, I can do this. I'm going to kill this Egyptian and I'm going to get this thing rolling. And now, Moses is full of self-doubt. No, wait, whoa, not, surely not me. No, 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 no. Surely it's got to be somebody better. So he was ready to deliver 40 years ago, but now when God's ready, Moses isn't ready. But God knows he's ready. Right? So Moses doesn't think he is, but God's like, look, I've decided you're ready, so you're ready. You weren't ready 40 years ago, but you're ready now. So again, a good lesson for us, we need to have a balance. We need to have a lot of humility, which Moses didn't have much of when he was 40 years old, but he's got it now. But at the same time, we do need to have some self-confidence in, in this sense. Not to say, well, I can do anything under the sun. No, I can't. I can't dunk a basketball. It won't matter how many times I practice, I can't do it. So there's some things I can't do. But in this sense, anything that God wants me to do, needs me to do, I can do. I can't tell God, well, no, God, I can't do that. Anything that He has planned for me, I can do. Just like here, Moses can do this. Because God said He could. And He's going to give Moses tools to do this too. He's not just going to abandon him, right? So we have that balance of humility. We're going to humble ourselves, but at the same time knowing that, well, if there's something that God wants me to do, yes, I can do it. I don't need to give God an excuse that I can't do it. And of course, probably the prime verse we use for that, Philippians 4 and 1, which says what? I can do all things. I can do all things through Christ which strengthened me. And again, the idea is not, yeah, I can jump to the moon. No, I can't. But the idea, I can do all things that God wants me, needs me to do. Yes, I can't. I can't tell God, well, God, you want me to do that, but that's impossible. I can't. Would God ever ask any of us to do something that's impossible? No, He would not. And, and that's the attitude that we need to have. So God tells Moses in verse 12, look, I'm I'll be with you. I'm not just going to let you, I'm not going to hang you out to dry. I'll be with you through this whole thing. You can do this. Okay? And, you know, if God were talking directly to us, if He told me that I could do something, I need to understand that I can do it. Because He's smarter than me. And He knows better. So He's telling Moses, you'll be able to do it. God's going to help him with miracles. God will not help us, you and me today, through miracles. He doesn't work that way. Not because He can't, but He doesn't. But how can God help us today? Yeah, through providence and this book right here. Well, man, it, it, would, have, it would be great if God would just talk to me like He talked to Moses. Well, does God talk to me? Right here. It's not audible. It's not verbal, but this is God talking to us. Okay? So we need to understand who you are, what your name is, what am I supposed to say? They're going to, well, what God did you talk to? What am I supposed to say? What's your name? What do I tell them? Again, he's just trying to get out of it. But God's answer demonstrates that He is eternal. Okay? And so when we look at God's answer here in uh, chapter 3, in verse 14, God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And He said, Thou shalt, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am have sent me unto you. Okay? Now we note in Revelation 1 and verse 8, 
where God says, I am Alpha and Omega. That's the first and the last letters of the Greek. I'm the beginning, I'm the, I'm everything. So he says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. God has always been and He always will be. He tells Moses, I am. They'll know what you mean when you say that. Now notice that Jesus uses the same terminology in John 8.58. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. So God tells Moses, You give them that answer, they'll believe you. They'll know you're talking to the true God, the living God. So God tells Moses, I want you to take the elders. I want you to go ask Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out into the wilderness and worship me. Grant them leave to go do this. Because they'd been allowed to do that under previous Pharaohs. It wasn't like that was a new thing. Other pharaohs had let them go out and sacrifice. And other people that didn't believe in God, but they would sacrifice their heathen gods too. They'd let their, their slaves, their workers do that. So let's start out with just a small request, something that would be fairly simple for pharaoh to go along with. God's going to give pharaoh a chance to be reasonable. Is he going to be reasonable? No. But that's not God's fault. God's going to give him every opportunity to do this. So then in verses 19-22, through 22, God knew Pharaoh's heart. He knew what he was going to say. Does that mean, did God make Pharaoh refuse? No. But He knew Pharaoh was going to refuse. Right? But He gave him a chance to make the right choice. Pharaoh, of course, rejects it. No, I'm not going to let you go out and do that. And God says He will smite Egypt for that. And that, of course, is going to be the ten plagues that we'll talk about. And apparently we see at the end of this chapter too that some, at least some of the Egyptians, a lot of them were sympathetic to the Israelites. And they're even going to give them some treasure when they leave. Okay? Maybe because, well, we benefited from their labor. Maybe they deserve something. But... They are going to give them, and God had prophesied, so they're going to load you up with stuff. Don't worry, you're going to get out, and when you do, you're not going to go empty-handed. So, you know, he's going to give Pharaoh every opportunity, but of course Pharaoh's not going to take advantage of that. Alright, chapter 4. So now we have objection number 3. Who am I to do this? What am I supposed to say? What am I? What's your name? Objection number three is really closely related to number two. He still insists, well, they're not going to believe me. Even after God said they would. So if you tell them that I am sent you, they'll believe you. Moses is still questioning that. I don't think they're going to believe me. Do what? Could have been, yeah. I mean, he's, he's really thought of it. He's had 40 years to think about it, yeah. So he's like, eh, maybe it's maybe I'm not the guy. With his first rejection. Yeah, yeah. So he's, he's still trying to wiggle out of it because he doesn't <laughs> believe in himself. He doesn't think he can do it, even though God is telling him, yes, you, I picked you to do this. So I, I just don't think they'll believe me. Well, God is going to give Moses the tools he needs. Again, I'm not going to let you go in there empty-handed. I'll be with you the whole way and I'm going to help you to convince these people that what you're saying is true. And it's going to take a while, but as we're going to see, that's all according to God's plan too. He doesn't want Pharaoh to let him go right off the bat. But he says, look, I'm going to give you tools you need to accomplish this task. Okay? As we said a minute ago, God's never going to ask you or me or anybody to do something that's impossible. So if God expects me to do something, 
will God give me the talent and the ability to do that? Absolutely He will. I cannot say, well, no, I just can't do that. God would never ask me or you or anyone to do something that is impossible to do. He's going to give us the ability to get that done. The question is, are we going to use what He's given us? So the same thing. He's going to give Moses what he needs. And Moses will use it. But that's the choice. Am I going to use it or not? Well, he will. So God is going to give Moses three tools, three miracles that he can use to prove that what he says is true. So Moses being the shepherd, you know, he's got a rod or a staff. And he tells Moses, I want you to throw that thing down on the ground. What happens? Turns into a serpent, a snake. And we see there in chapter 4 when, when he did this in verse 3, and it became a serpent, and Moses fled from before it. Okay? So Moses, apparently, we don't know, you know what kind of snake was it. It must have been a dangerous one. You know, they're a garden snake. They're a snake. For me, the only good snake is a dead snake. That's my personal opinion. But there are some snakes that are pretty harmless, right? But obviously this one, Moses must have instinctively recognized maybe a viper, but some kind of poisonous. And so he, he runs away from this thing. That thing could kill me. That's deadly. So that's important. Because then God is going to tell him I want you to pick that up. I want you to pick up that snake by its tail. What? What? Like you told me, I want you to pick up that rattlesnake by its tail. I, you're going to have a hard time making me do that. Right? Because I'm going to be like, Mo, I'm going to be running in the opposite direction. I certainly don't want to pick the thing up. But God said, I want you to pick it up and pick it up by the tail. Now, why is that significant? Well, and I had to do research on this because I... I'm not much of a snake handler myself, right? But anybody that knows anything about snakes will tell you the worst place to pick up a snake is by the tail. Okay? Because they're limber, right? And they can turn around and bite you. You don't want to get them by the tail. I guess people think, well, the tail's the farthest away from the head, so I'll grab that. But that head's going to come back and get you. So they'll, the people that are professional snake handlers, they'll tell you, you want to grab the snake by the neck. I don't want to grab it at all, but you want to grab the by the neck, right behind the head, then the snake can't get you. That's what you want to do. But God doesn't tell him, grab it by the neck. He says, I want you to grab it by the tail. The worst place he can grab it. So what is the, and Moses is going to do it. What does that require? Yeah, and faith. Faith that God is not going to let that snake bite and kill him. Right? Because Moses was obviously scared because he ran from it. God's like, hey, get back over here. Pick that thing up by the tail. Trust me. So Moses does. And it turns back into a rod again. And Moses, uh, God's like, and you can use that whenever you need to. You throw that thing down, it's going to turn into a serpent. You pick it back up, it's going to turn into the rod again. That Nobody should be able to question the miraculous nature of that. So that's one tool he gives him. Secondly, he tells him, he says, I want you to put your hand inside your cloak, touch your chest. And then when you pull that hand back out again, you're going to have leprosy. Now what's leprosy? Yeah, really dreaded. You were unclean if you had. It's about the worst thing you could get back then. If you pull that hand out, you're going to have leprosy. Well, what's the good news? The good news is when you put that hand back in there, touch your chest again, pull it out again, you'll be instantly cleansed. So you'll be able to show people you have the power of God on your side. Not anybody could do that. And then thirdly, he said, you can take some of the water out of the Nile River, take some of that water, pour it on the ground, it will instantly literally turn into blood. That's the third tool you can use. You've got the rod, you can do the leprosy thing, and you can turn the Nile water into blood. Now, probably some symbolism there because the Egyptians worshipped the Nile River. They thought it was a god. So God is showing His power over the fake Egyptian gods. Look, I can turn your god into whatever I want. 
I'll take it from water, which is life-giving, turn into blood, which we understand is life-giving. Did they understand that? No, they did not. We know it. But God said it all along. But it took modern science a long time to figure that out. You know, they used to bleed people when they got sick. Oh, blood's poisonous. But that would show his power over the, the so-called Egyptian god of the, of the Nile River. Okay? And so these are three tools that he gives Moses to use. Now, let's look at objection number four. Moses claims, yeah, but but I, I'm just I'm not a good speaker. Some have spoke, maybe had a speech impediment, at least that's what he's claiming. I, I'm just not very eloquent. I, why would you pick me? You need somebody that's really can give a great speech. And come on, Lord, that's not me. I'm I'm just I'm not a good talker. So when he says this, God reminds him. You know, Moses said there in verse 10, I'm slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And you know, he's, he's making all these excuses. God said, who do you think made the mouth of men, including yours, and the tongue of men, including yours? Who, who did that? Yeah, I did. I know how you speak. You're not telling me anything I don't know. You can do this. And remember, we saw earlier where it said he was powerful of speech, right? So, But now he's claiming that he can't really do it. So God's patience is wearing a little bit thin with Moses after four excuses of why he can't do something that God says, yes, you can do it, and you're going to do it. So he gets mad at Moses, and so God tells him, well, your brother Aaron, I'm going to send for your brother Aaron, and he does that in verse 27. He tells Aaron to go to Moses. Aaron's going to come meet you, and Aaron is going to help you with Pharaoh. I'm going to be with you. Your brother Aaron's going to be with you. You can get this done. So, in verses 18 through 23, I'll finish this chapter quick. Back up, back up, back quit. Verses 18 through 23, so Moses gets permission from Jethro to go back to Egypt. He's going to take his family with him, his wife and his son. Again, the Egyptians that wanted to kill him are dead, so he's been told it's, it's okay to go back. And God knew that Pharaoh was he's going to resist. God knows that. But it's, it works according to God's plan because this will allow God to demonstrate his power as he continues to escalate the plagues. It allows God to demonstrate his power not only to the Egyptians, but who else? The Israelites. Yeah, they need to see this too. They need to understand God's power. And so it's going to work the way it needs to work. So yeah, Pharaoh's not going to let them go the first or the second or the third. You know, they're going to go through ten plagues. And God tells Moses that I want you to tell Pharaoh that I consider Israel my first son. And so he says, if you will not release Israel, then God is going to kill Pharaoh's first son. Now will he do that? He will. That's the tenth plague. Plague of the first. So you see a little bit of foreshadowing there. Okay. Then verses 24 through 26, we see a little episode here where God's very angry with Moses. He afflicts him with some kind of disease or something. And why did he do that? Well, because in Genesis 17, God had commanded Abraham, you are to circumcise all the male children. For whatever reason, Moses hadn't done that with his own son. As you can imagine, God ain't too thrilled about that. You're going to go and you're going to speak for me and you're going to be the leader of the Israelites and you're not even obeying my commands? you got to do what I tell you to do. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I think that's probably... We, we're not told specifically, but I think that's a good... 
that she wasn't real thrilled about that, and so Moses kind of caved in to her instead of, well, honey, we got to do this because this is what God commands. But for whatever reason, he, he hadn't done it, and so God punishes him. So his wife, she winds up doing it, and she is not a happy camper about having to do this, but she does, and after that, God allows Moses to recover. And they can continue on. Okay, so then in those last verses, 27 through 31, we just see Moses and Aaron. They're joyfully reunited. And Aaron goes and he tells the elders what God had told Moses, and Moses told Aaron. Aaron goes and tells the elders. He performs the miracles, the signs, the rod, and all those kind of things. Now the people start to believe Moses. Okay, well, he, he must really be from God. And it closes out saying they're thankful that God's going to deliver them and they bow in reverence and they worship God because He's, he's going to deliver them. All right, I know we got to stop there, so I was hoping to get a little bit further. But anyway, any questions or comments through chapter 4? Oh, 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 Genesis 17. In chapter 17 of Genesis, God had commanded them to be circumcised. And so He said, I told Abraham that's always been a rule and you haven't done it. You can't continue on unless you do that. So, Genesis 17. All right, well, thank you all for coming. I know I kept you over a little bit again tonight.